Hi, Jake. Hi. It's really nice to meet you. Yes, I'm glad to be here. You have come to this channel because yeah. of your feeling that there's something about borderline personality disorder that really captures your experience. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about how you came to having that diagnosis? Um, so for years, actually, I heard the term borderline personality disorder. I'm like, I don't know, the name kind of was like, eh, a, I'm not even going to look into it. So, whoops. <laughs> well, what was it about the name? I don't know. And also, um, well, also, my uh, my sister suspected, my sister, like, upon, like, her own research that my mother had that. So that's why I didn't want to be associated with that name, um, you know, because... You know, I didn't want to be anything like my mother. So, I, yeah, just kind of searching for answers. And I was like, I just kept an open mind and then, you know, searched YouTube videos, people talking about it, just kind of engulfing myself in that world and welcoming any possibility. So that's how it came about that. And then I just brought it to doctor's attention. And well, what had happened for you before that? Had you been in treatment for a long time? Yeah, um, since I was 11, which I'm going to be 28 um, next month. So trial and error, definitely. <laughs> well, d can you tell me a little about that story of trial and error? What brought you into treatment to begin with when you're only 11 years old? Um, just witnessing a lot of bad things like abuse and all that and just very very scarring things that were detrimental to my sister my brother and i and even my mom like she also was a victim too in her own right so when we were taken and placed with our father divorced um just yeah all of us sought out treatment. I mean, I didn't know what was going on half the time though, because I thought the life I was living was normal. Like the history, like abuse, like, so I thought that was normal. So I'm like, why am I in therapy? Nothing's wrong. Even though it was wrong, I knew it was, but I didn't at the same time, so. At the time yeah. you didn't really have yeah. an orientation to what to do with the therapy mm -hmm. you had. Yeah, and then I don't know why it stopped, I think. Yeah, so I don't remember the next time I was in therapy. I think I was 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. So, because I, it, yeah. So that first therapy ended, and then you went back into therapy when you were 15. Yeah. What had happened between that time? A lot of creativity, <laughs> a lot of writing, a lot of camcorder recording, thinking I'm a great short filmmaker <laughs> um, but just a lot of creativity um and just neglect too so like we kept like i would leave at like 9 p.m come back seven in the morning and no one would notice i was gone so that's the difference between my father and my mother's so my father's like neglect and not being worried about my mother i would you know get name called and glass shattering all over the carpet and holes in the wall. So it's like, pick your poison. Mm -hmm. So um, so I ended well, up moving, be yeah. Between this kind of very yeah. scary degree yeah. of chaos, chaos and every day. feeling fear to feeling like mm -hmm. you're being neglected. Yeah, so I got to choose, no courts let you choose which parent, if they're deemed both safe, which neither were, but it's like five months I'll deal with them, I'll move, yeah, I was moving back and forth, so just because I can handle them for a little bit. It's just, yeah, it's a very unhealthy way of thinking, but that's the unhealthy environment I was in that caused this. Well, what about this development of your creativity? Because I think this is actually a really important part of mm -hmm. your story. So tell me a bit about how you developed that side of yourself in the face mm -hmm. of this instability that you were in. Yeah, um, I was... So I started a writing probably while I was in the middle of so my mother started seeing someone and he ultimately ruined her life. My uh, stepfather um, ultimately was the cycle of where things started going wrong. Um, so I don't know. I started journaling, but like in a, it wasn't about my life. It was almost like someone else, alter ego or whatever. It took me out of the world. It took me, especially writing fiction. I didn't. I like I, writing about myself with poetry and all that. That's like 
it's cathartic. It helps a lot, but I prefer to write fiction, which because I don't want to. I, I don't want to think about me. I already think about my issues enough in life, you know, like because I'm forced to live with it. So writing about other people and their experiences is really great. Um, like you know, like a drug. It was great. It was almost like an you know addiction because I just notebooks full at all time because it just took me away. So. Well, developing a capacity to distance yourself from it, your experience and process some of it, but not be too close to it, in the absence of enough stability or support to kind of really mm. think more clearly about what was going on. But can we go back to that? What was going on for you during that time? Um, so when I moved back in with my mother when I was like 15, she would play like best mother of the month every time we'd move back. So it's, it was like, you know, perfect month, you know, perfect mother for a month and then things went downhill. So she got me therapy um, because... Can we yeah. go back mm -hmm. to what that means for you? Mm -hmm. So you said she was a perfect mother mm -hmm. every time you would re-enter the household. Mm -hmm. What did that look like? Um, cooking every day. She wouldn't, wouldn't be talking to, you know, our stepfather like she would... because throughout her entire life until her, her passing. Um, he was an addiction to her for like 18, 18 years? I'm sorry, like 16 years. Back and forth, back and forth. So every time we'd move in, she'd be done with them. And she always made it seem like it was believable. Um, and then just, you know, taking care of our needs, you know, cause we're kids, you know, like, it almost felt like we had to take care of her needs, like even when we were young. So, you know, that weight of not having to take care of our mother when we're like 12, 13, 14, 15, because mm -hmm. we had to be her support system. But what about finally getting her to start taking care of you mm -hmm. and the hope of maybe her leaving this addiction of hers? Mm -hmm. What was that like for you? Very, it was very like, Hopeful, not hopeful, hopeful. It was up and down every like, because when she would like fade from being the perfect mother, like it was just misery every day. Like literally she would flip out over like little things. Like she would just throw like big like candles across the wall. So it's just, I don't know. And then later like she would be okay and you know, want to watch TV together. So it was, very, it was very confusing, very like not knowing, living on your toes. It's very unpredictable, yeah. which side of her that you're gonna Never get. Knew. Yeah. How did you manage that, being a kid? <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> I don't know. I just wasn't present and I don't know. I just was very mad and losing my mind literally. And, but li writing, yeah, helped and took me far away and it's almost because like when you're being abused and all that it's almost like normalized so you're like thinking not thinking so i was aware it was bad but i wasn't at the same time i didn't realize i don't know it's not like i thought other kids were being abused and hit and yelled at and you know but i i don't know i didn't think like that but it just just seemed normal. Oh, my mother. Oh, she's in a good mood today. Oh, never mind, you know. Well, how do you think these fluctuations and disappointments have formed your personality now? Um, <laughs> never believing. I don't know. I just don't believe people when they're showing good intentions. I'm waiting for the... Oh, I am always waiting for the worst thing to happen. Like today, yesterday, I'm always worried someone's gonna harm me. So, because that was, you know, her husband, you know, my stepfather, he'd always be in the picture somehow and he would always like holes in the wall. And so it was very, un it was scary. It's like, that shit was scary. Like I literally thought I was gonna die every day. Like, it, like, and, that's awful. Yeah, and that's not even, it's not an exaggeration. You know, people are like, oh, come on. No, it was like that, it was like, you know, I'm surprised I didn't end up like a feral child, <laughs> you know. It sounds quite serious, the story you're telling me, that you're a little kid 
and your mother would really go back and forth between providing some hope that she might protect you and take good care of mm -hmm. you. And then the next moment, that falling apart mm -hmm. and feeling the misery of mm -hmm. the situation you were realistically in. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like one of the ways that you learned how to cope, Jacob, is to detach yourself in the world of fantasy or creating a story that has less um, fear to it. Mm -hmm. And now <laughs> you're in a place where you really cannot even trust the good in relationships mm -hmm. you have. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. It's awful. Mm -hmm. But we're learning. <laughs> well, we're learning. let's <laughs> back up a second. Do you mind if we go back to that? Mm -hmm. How is that affecting your relationships now? Mm -hmm. Like, with, like, what exactly? The oh. part of it where even the good in people, you are constantly in a state of mistrust and mm -hmm. fear that it can't last or it can't be real. Okay. And the other shoe is going to drop at any moment. Mm -hmm. Well, so when I moved out of my mom's house, ultimately, I thought I was going to be like, happy instantly i didn't realize I, I was naive to think like i'm gonna move out and i'm gonna feel like a brand new person which you know i did ultimately you know but i didn't realize i was gonna be in therapy for a long time i didn't realize i thought i was gonna be ultimately like recovered and all that which you know isn't the case but um yeah it's trust is a problem because i ended up dating someone who is really awful to me like brainwashing so i haven't really had time to recover except for the last like year and a half like i haven't like meeting people i always think they're like gonna harm me or they're gonna betray me or they're gonna use it against me if i'm vulnerable like even like last year i was like trying to get into the dating world again but i was scared they were gonna literally physically harm me and it's like not great because you know life is lonely so it's like we all need to find people who care about us so absolutely um yeah but it sounds like what you're saying jacob is that this template of your early life with your mother mm. and your stepfather has created a sense of mistrust that mm. makes it impossible for you mm. to get close to people mm. because you have this expectation that they're going to harm you that comes mm. from a real experience mm. So do you mind telling me a little bit more about this relationship where you feel like the other person was really harming you and brainwashing you? Oh yeah. How um, did that relationship start? You know, here it's so funny because it's like, so I was in the newspaper and uh, you know, with the school, um, the school I was going to is such a fun time. Um, and so, he messaged me on Facebook, and he's also like 13 years older than me, so he had that power over me, which that's a whole nother issue. Um, but he started messaging, so he was like my age now, isn't that freaking weird? Oh my god, that like literally makes my head spin. Um, but um, yeah, I was 14, and he was, I thought he was being friendly because I was naive, and then he just kind of kept up with me throughout the years until I was of legal age, and then yeah, we started dating. Four years, I was naive, um, but, you know, he took advantage of that, and, I don't know, he would say, do awful things, say the worst things about me, and then be like, well, you don't know what love is because you never experienced it growing up, so this is a crash course on it and stuff like that, so he literally made me think, like, the way he was treating me was normal, so I would go to therapy, and I would, you know, he'd be like, you're so defensive, you're so defensive, which I am, but what he was saying and doing, I had the right to be defensive. I had the right to be like, this isn't okay. But, you know, I was young. I didn't know better. You know, you think someone is, you know, he, I, yeah. He took advantage and then he waited and, you know, was giving reflections of, you know, my mother also, you know. I, you know, they say you end up with people like, you know, people who hurt you and stuff like that, so. Well, I wonder if what you mean by that is that there was this new hope that this person might be able to take an interest yeah. in you and take care of you oh, in a yeah. way that you needed it. Yeah, that's definitely true. But then something happened that actually led to 
something very harmful happening. To yeah, you. I, uh, I don't know. I was very much infatuated too, and maybe he was at first. I don't know his deal. Um, but yeah, it was definitely detrimental. Like I was making steps into rec you know recovery or you know healing or whatever, and he definitely knocked me back some steps for a few years. And like you Let's made, yeah. talk about that infatuation, mm -hmm. though, because I think that's the beginning mm -hmm. point of these relationships that end up very harmful to mm -hmm. you. So what was it about that infatuation? It, like, ultimately, it was like, became obsession, too. And like, just, I don't know, needing this other person because... I felt very alone, alone, like, I, and, and I kind of was, in a way, I felt like I was on, you know, on my own, too. I mean, I was literally walking the street at age 15 for eight hours at night, like, literally, I would leave, like I said earlier, I would leave for hours, just literally pace it, because I just, I don't know, I felt like a missing piece was inside me, even at that, and it's just, it's weird to look back, I'm like, I was so young. Like, why was I feeling like that? Anyway, but yeah, I uh, clung on to him, and he kind of was the right person to... I mean, like, it was the perfect person who... It was a perfect trap. It was a perfect trap. Like, it, all what things What made went, him the right person? I don't know. Um, just because he was looking for someone vulnerable. He kind of likes to fix people. Uh, he thinks he's fixing people. He likes people who are broken. And it makes him feel like he's complete. That's the best way I can put it. It makes him feel whole by finding these broken pieces of people. Mm -hmm. But, um... I'll respect. <laughs> I'll respect to him. <laughs> well, I do think you understand something about this, Jacob, yeah. is that you were so vulnerable at that time with all the instabilities you were facing at home. And so in your need to lean on someone, you found this person who was really wanting mm. to fix you. And you were hoping that that might oh, yeah. happen. I, uh, yeah, throughout like my life, I thought I needed to find another person to be with they would fix me and that's obviously not the right way to think but you know when you're 15 16 17 18 you think the other person's gonna save you and all that stuff um yeah yeah well why wouldn't you want that yeah exactly. given what's what had happened to mm -hmm. you yeah but now what in relationships still because you have an insight in this. Mm -hmm. What do you think unfolds that it's difficult to get over? Yeah, that's the tricky part is like people say, you gotta get over your past. You know, that's what I, I hear all, you know, you gotta move on. And it's like, I'm not even thinking about the past a lot, most of the time. It's like almost like an aftertaste, like the dust after and like, I don't know, like people are like, just let it, I'm like, I'm literally just, trying to go to work without having a panic attack or that you know i'm literally just trying to like not have these like moments of frustration and then five seconds later crying and then feel like everyone secretly hates me like da 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 or feel like someone's gonna poison me you know like thinking you know being all over the place so yeah well, that sounds really terribly difficult, mm -hmm. is that what you're saying to me, Jacob, if I understand you correctly, is that every day you're just trying to get through the day mm -hmm. and these things just intrude on you, the panic, oh, yeah. the fear, mm -hmm. the question of whether or not you're going to get through the day. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like it leads to a sense of something about you and what you feel about yourself. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? What it is that you feel about yourself when you're trying to get through the day? Um, lately, I've been like, see like even at work, dropping a fork or whatever, I'm like, you're so freaking stupid, you're so stupid, this is why, this, this always, this is why, dot, 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 this is why, this, this is why that, and it's almost like punishing myself, but like, it's all about trying to change my mind <laughs> like literally and it's like I, it's very exhausting i am exhausted by like you know within a few hours into my day because it's like i'm literally trying to train my mind to not hate me <laughs> so you know my experience with that is just 
going to the store to get milk, I'm like, okay, everyone's watching me, everyone's watching me, you know, everyone, you know, here is watching me, everyone's listening, they're thinking this, you know, they're thinking that, they're, are, is that person coming, are they going to attack me, turn my music off, you know, so I could hear what they're saying, in case they're thinking of plotting an attack, it's literally like on guard 24-7, mm-hmm. and like, I work in customer service, and I don't know, it's, I'm almost safe there also so like that like that can kind of that doesn't happen when I'm behind you know the bar or whatever because it's almost like I'm a different person (laughs) like I'm like you know I I don't know that's interesting how like customer service doesn't overwhelm me but everything else like once I'm like leaving work I'm like it's back on (laughs) well that makes sense to me because it sounds like what you're saying Jacob is that on a day-to-day basis, because you can't trust other people, you work really hard to manage yourself, Mm. and it's an exhausting process in the face of all the fears you have. But when you do go to work, you can put on a kind of role or a version of yourself that seems to make life a little bit more clear and Mm. easy and automatic for you. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about what you feel about yourself in that role in customer service? What do you do there? How do you define yourself? And how does that organize your interactions with other people? I have fun with it. I actually enjoy, I'm, you know, right now I'm a bartender, which is funny because I don't drink anymore because I have a drinking problem. (laughs) So it's like really funny. It's like, hi, I'm Jacob, you're an alcoholic bartender. How can I help you? Um, You know, I feel like I become the person I want to be 24 seven almost. Like I, I can be outgoing, I can be social, I can be fun, I can, but when I'm alone, oh God, I don't know. It's like, oh God, why'd I say that? Why'd I say that? But you know, people like me, you know, and it's like, I don't know. I'm actually good at it and I feel good about myself and I never feel good about myself. So it's like, you know, if I feel good about, like I feel almost guilty feeling good about myself, so. <laughs> well, what I hear you saying is that there's something that you've been able to develop mm. for yourself where you can really hone in on what other people yeah. want and need mm. in this role mm. of doing customer service or in being a bartender, mm. that you've developed this intuition yeah. about people. Yeah. that helps you be able to deliver what you think they want yeah. from you. I like helping other people and like often like especially working in the coffee shop um, brightening people's day because I often feel terrible so I, I feel better about myself when I like make someone smile or like because we all have things going on in life we, you know so brightening people's day so that's all that's when I feel good it's like people walking in, frown on their face, leaving with a smile. And I know that's like cheesy, like customer service, yeah. But like, I don't know, it, that's real. That's what makes mm-hmm. me feel good. I actually don't think it's cheesy because with everything that you've been through and the feelings you have about yourself being the cause of your problems at times, having some experience of yourself as contributing to someone else's day or making things better or making someone happy seems to bring you some comfort and self-worth. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to share with you a worry I have about you. Oh, joy. <laughs> from just knowing you a brief time oh, during boy. this conversation is I fear that you spend so much energy taking care of the other person in the interaction to keep yourself safe. Mm-hmm and to know how to manage, that you are not able to be seen or get your needs met Mm -hmm. in those interactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) Yeah, I'm very self-aware, which is awful. Like, it's great, but, you know, some people, a lot of people need more self-awareness, I feel, but I'm a little too self-aware, and I, I would like take it back a notch because it's like I have like 12 eyes like I, I'm always scanning I, I picking up this it's like always analyzing everything so um, it's like yeah I notice I, I said something about you in my understanding of you I don't actually know if it was accurate or not mm. and the next thing you did was criticize yourself is that true yes <laughs> well that's awful it is awful. Yeah. What do you make of that? Uh, 
I don't handle good things about me well. Like people saying, good. oh, I don't believe anyone when they say anything good about me. I'm like, you're lying. You're just trying to make me feel better. And I'm like, it's very toxic to myself at least. And it can be to the other people, you know, like they're trying to help. And a lot of people don't know how to help, but you know, they, they mean well. Everyone has good intentions, I feel, so. Is that true? Uh, that's not true, but every, you know, that's not true. Ob obviously, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm very. I always criticize myself. I always punish myself for. I don't know why. Well, w let's think about that together. What What does that do for you, to continuously have to manage yourself by telling yourself that you're bad or you need to do something differently or you didn't do something right? What does that do for you? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, purpose. <laughs> I I don't know. I can be deemed as the bad person. I always feel like I'm a bad person. I feel like I always have to prove I'm not a bad person. I'm not a bad person. But like, I'm not. Like, I volunteer at animal shelters. Like, I was going to school to, you know, work uh, as a sign language interpreter. Um, so it's like, you know, writing books and all that. Wanting to help people. Wanting to... You know, I'm awful at explaining how I feel. Um, but it's all about proving to myself or other people I'm not awful. I'm not a bad person, you know. A lot of guilt, a lot of shame. Don't know how to get rid of that. Don't know how to fix that. So, yeah. Because <laughs> it's literally like, it's guilt. And I think that's the main recipe to my chaos. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're trying to revise something about yourself that you hold very centrally to motivate building a better life. But I think that part of you that is buried underneath that, that feels so damaged or to blame for your problems, I think also gets in the way of your feeling able to integrate things about yourself that are more positive. Mm. Because even when I talk to you about things that might be um, positive or affirming about you, I think you seem to get a bit uncomfortable with that. You don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very, I mean, I'm always uncomfortable. That's literally like, I'm never comfortable. Like, I'm always like nervously smiling or laughing, even when I'm talking about something serious. So I'm just, I live in a fluctuating state of uncomfortability. It's fun. <laughs> it doesn't look fun. No. But I think that maneuver that you just made to kind of seal over how painful your life is by saying it's fun or it's fine, I wonder if that's for my benefit to mm. get me off the hook about worrying about you. Yeah, well, I, I would say for a while, I'm like, people probably should be worried about me. I'm in a decent place right now, but that's literally what I, I don't know. Jacob, what? What? let's go back. <laughs> what? <laughs> I think there's something about the possibility that I could be worried and concerned mm. about you, that you seem to want to run away from. Okay. <laughs> Do you so, think that's accurate? I mean, yeah, I don't, oh, I don't want people to worry about me, but like also like... Can you say more about that? What would happen if I were worried about you? Um, oh, um, I don't believe people are actually worried about me. Like people only, I don't know. I feel like people only have, not me, because I'm, 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 people only look out for themselves. And I know that's like very cut and dry but I feel like the people that I've experienced but I'm meeting new people and like I'm changing I'm growing but like people I've come in contact with are s selfish and you know not they everyone. have been yeah selfish and damaging mm -hmm. so if I were to be worried about you there may be something in it for me that leads me to harm you oh yeah oh yeah I think at literally like everyone is and that's awful because I know it's not true everyone's out to get me but that's like 
I can sit here and say, I know people aren't going to hurt me. I know no one's going to break into my house. I know no one's putting cameras in my house. I know no one's coming for me. Coming for me. That's like a big thing. Someone's coming for me to take me away. If I hear a twig outside crack, probably by the wind or neighbors, I'm like, they're, come, they're here. You know, it's like constant anxiety. And, um, but there's yeah. something more essential here mm -hmm. is that all your life you've been looking for someone to look out for you, mm -hmm. protect you, and take care of you. Mm -hmm. But even when someone actually understands what difficulty you've faced and continue to face every day, mm -hmm. it's hard to accept that they may actually be concerned about you oh, and be yeah. helpful. For sure. Yeah. And that sounds actually very isolating. Oh yeah, I isolating, very isolating, very uh, difficult. <laughs> but we're trying to make changes. I can see you are, but I think this discrepancy between what you understand would be better for you, improving mm -hmm. your life, and solving the problems of borderline personality disorder are interrupted by these really deeply seated ideas and fears you have about people. Yeah, it's pretty violating to myself, like when people are trying to, they're trying, people, there have been good people who've tried, <laughs> and it's like... Well, tell me more about that. How have good people tried to help you? just you know fought hard and wanted me to better myself took me to like appointments and stuff like that and just encouraged me and then ultimately like just a lot of ironically fear of an abandonment but like also pushing people away and then it's like that push and pull back and forth seesaw type thing of you know you need to stay away. No, please don't, please don't go. Like, you know, type thing. And it's literally like pacing the apartment like nine million times of like, you know, worrying the next thing's gonna happen, you know. It's very just uh, debilitating. Very, con very static. Like, there's always something going on. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Can you know. give me an example of someone who is really invested yeah. in you? Where oh. these symptoms of borderline personality disorder, the frantic efforts to avoid abandonment and this push-pull of you needing them but fearing them, how has that played out in a specific relationship? Um, so we're still friends, but I was with someone for like a year and a half, um, and he was... He's a good person and you know we still talk with friends like we literally just talked earlier and there's no like you know I don't we're just friends and um, I got out of my relationship with the, the awful ex he was you know the next person I and he literally taught me it's okay you know to suggest a movie because I was I, I literally wouldn't even suggest a movie because I was scared I was gonna be like told you that's a stupid idea why would you like that why would you yeah here's and I wouldn't eat in front of him because I was like that's how like I was scared because I was told I eat like a barbarian you know I eat like you're a you're gross you're disgusting you know so like he just by like sitting in the living room eating like fast food and watching like shows and stuff it I felt safe I felt <sighs> I felt safe and that's something I was searching for for a long time and but I didn't believe it would be lasting I didn't believe you know I, I always thought the worst was coming and so he would like go out of his way I mean he lived like 45 minutes an hour away and he like literally like brought me to emergency rooms because I was having a breakdown or you know even when like I pretty much broke up with him at that point. Um, he was still helping. He had good. He he's a good person. Mm -hmm. It sounds like he was really reliable and mm -hmm. there for you and not critical of you mm -hmm. in a way that you needed. Mm -hmm. But you said you broke up with him. Yeah. What happened? Um, I was just angry. I was sad. I was confused. I was just all over the place, and I was just. 
I was a fool. <laughs> well, again, you're going to be hard on yourself yeah. about why you pushed this person that you so needed away. Mm. But it sounds like you were in a lot of pain mm. and you were angry, sad, and confused is what I mm. think I, you just said. How do you think that influenced the way you saw this person? Um, I almost wanted to make him a person that he actually isn't. Like, he says something, oh God, why'd he say it like that? Oh my God, he, is he changing his mind about me? Does he hate me now? And, uh, and then like almost needing reassurance. And it's so annoying, it's so annoying. After a while, you gotta be like content in the relationship. After a while, you gotta be like chill the fuck out. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know. He wasn't that bothered by how I act. And I almost felt like he, I, not deserve, not, I hate that, not deserve, but like I should have gotten a bigger reaction, but he was so understanding and I was like getting mad about that. I'm like, why don't you see me as a freak? Why don't you see, like, how do you see me as a good person? How do you see me? Like, you actually are looking at me like I'm a, I'm good looking. I'm like, why? It's weird. Like, why are you doing this? What are you, are you going to hurt me in the end? And it's just, I literally had to make him, it's almost like I was making him a bad person in my mind that he was, he was, on, he was on his way to detouring me from recovery. And you know, that was bad. <laughs> that was awful. Like, I wish I handled that differently, but I didn't. <laughs> can, I, I, can I check if I have understood you mm -hmm. correctly, but there was something about your need for this guy mm -hmm. that made you really prone to needing constant reassurance mm -hmm. that he wasn't going to harm you. And mm -hmm. you were almost like hyper vigilant to those signs. And then you were easily feeling threatened in mm -hmm. a way that made you challenge him and that his patient reactions then became very confusing to you. Yeah. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. He's, you know, He's a cool person. <laughs> well, he had a lot of patience mm -hmm. and understanding mm -hmm. and support of you. Mm -hmm. But I still am confused about how you broke up with him. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I was having... I just... How did I? I just... I, I found a little problem that he was doing and I made it a thing. Even though I have like 99 problems, he can only have one type thing. <laughs> uh, but no, I... I wasn't the nicest person. I could have been nicer and, you know, I, it's tough. It's tough and it's tough to see someone you care about suffering probably. I was suffering. I was suffering and, um, you know, he brought me to the emergency room twice and that was fun. <laughs> that was great. I enjoyed that very much. I sent some stuff. <laughs> I enjoyed that. So. But yeah, ultimately, well, can you I just say a bit out. more about what happened there with the emergency room? Oh, so yeah. was that a culmination of your efforts to kind of push him away? Oh yeah, and I just that, and also I wanted to. I, this is the point where I wanted to feel better. I just wanted to feel better. Like I've been in and out of there. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, in and out of like emergency rooms since I was like 16 years old for self harm and all this stuff. So. This time I went voluntarily or whatever, and they wanted to admit me and stuff like that, but I didn't want to be because I have dogs and I would be like, my dogs help me so much, but I do get very anxious worrying about them. Like I have a camera now that I can like set up on my phone where I'm at work, I could see them, but like literally worried about the house catching on fire, like anything that could go wrong. So, um. Well, we were talking about how this breakup occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. <laughs> and, and there was something about this partner of yours oh, that yeah. was very patient and mm -hmm. supportive and trying to yeah. be there for you. And you were sad, angry, mm -hmm. harming yourself, unable to use yeah. his support, and unable to feel like you maybe deserved what he had to offer. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that you kept going to the emergency room. Was that a part of what ended the relationship? Oh no, he was gonna still stick it out. I just, I also probably just needed to be alone at that point and... What does that mean? Because it sounds like you're sending all sorts of signals up 
that you needed somebody. I did. But I don't know. I had this thing. I didn't want to drag anyone down. I had this and, you know, we still talk and, you know, he's with someone. I'm actually with someone now. Um, He's great. Um, I just wanted to, like, get that out there. Um, So, I don't know. I just was in a very weird place where I've always been with someone also or trying to find someone. So, to you know, that's literally what I would do. Just anyone who would look at me, you know, it was very desperate, very desperate for a distraction. That's what my life's been about, distracting myself some way. So... I didn't have a lot of time to focus on me because, like you actually said earlier, focusing on other people's needs, like, you know, my mother, you know, making sure they're okay, making sure they're okay. So, Your dogs. Yeah, they, yeah, making sure everyone else and my dogs are okay, but, you know, not focusing on me, which, you know, is cliche, but you really do got to take care of yourself. Well, I think that circles us back to a realization that you've mentioned about your journey is that when you realize that you're going to have to figure out a way to take care of yourself, you found this path to Mm -hmm. working on your problems of Mm -hmm. borderline personality disorder. And what we've just talked about is how you may have pushed that very reliable, supportive person away out of almost a way to protect him. Yeah. That's and take care of him. <laughs> that's accurate. You're good at this. Well, <laughs> like you're kind of doing with me now, which is that I think every time we go into a painful area of your life, I think you start to become entertaining mm-hmm. and de- deflect away. And I wonder if you're trying to spare me somehow from something. Perhaps. Might that might be, be hard something. for me. Uh, okay. <laughs> well. Well, what do you make of that? That's yeah, pretty accurate. I always got to make a joke or smile awkwardly. It's uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable always. And even when good things are happening, even when... I just live in a yeah, state of uncomfortability, even when good things are happening. I'm uncomfortable cuddling, you know, my boyfriend sometimes. I'm uncuddling, you know, just enjoying shows and stuff. It's just like, wow, I feel good. Why? <laughs> what, you're, are you allowed? So. Well, both feeling good and actually connecting with someone who might care about you seems to be an area of real difficulty Mm -hmm. even though you seem to understand you need that Mm -hmm. you have this very complicated way of pulling it in and then pushing it away yeah (laughs) Uh uh-huh and you know you mentioned that now you have a partner yeah he's great that is um great to you how are you managing that now actually kind of well like i'm surprised but it's hard. <laughs> well, what's changed? Knowing my diagnosis, knowing why. Oh my God, it's for so long. I'm like, why am I operated like this? And you know, now I have some, an- I'm still searching for some answers, but like, I know a little more of why I act the way I do, why I do this and what I can do. You know, I know some skills and stuff like that. I know, you know, sometimes they work better than, I, you know, Sometimes it's not possible, it feels, to, like, calm myself down. But I have some control. And I'm also welcoming uh, welcoming good things. I'm having uncomfortable discussions. I mean, this is, pretty, this is pretty uncomfortable. But, you know, in a good way. You know, like, it's who wants to talk about their feelings? Like, who wants to talk about the most painful moments in their life? No one does. But with this relationship, you know... I don't know, it's going at the perfect pace, and he just has a lot of things I don't want to run away from. I mean, he's very good, kind, considerate, listens, understood. You said that about a year and a half ago, Mm. you learned that you had this diagnosis, and that it's clarified Mm. and understanding for yourself. Yeah. So what do you think you need to look out for in this relationship to help yourself get your needs met oh, and be yeah. loved? Um, realizing he doesn't secretly hate me. 
uh, realizing, you know, just because, I don't know, he might have a certain tone or whatever, or a look on his face doesn't mean he secretly wants to leave me. He's plotting, you know, I can't wait till he leaves. Like, I'll misinterpret everything. So trying to cancel that out, trying to believe him when, you know, he says good things about me. I'm just like, are you sure? No, that's not me. That's not true. And, but, you know, we're working on that. Like, I'm telling myself, why would he lie? Why would he do all these good things for me if he didn't ha have, if he didn't care about me? Like, am I talk, asking other people, like, does this sound crazy? Am I overreacting? Does he mean it like this? Or does he, or am I twisting it? Because that's how other people have reacted, you know? So it's like learning... Not everyone is going to hurt you or kill you or want to kill you or poison you or this, you know. It's literally like trying to prove myself what I initially think wrong, which it's working. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. Well, I think it sounds like you realize your tendencies to mm -hmm. search out signs that mm -hmm. you're going to be harmed or criticized or abandoned. Mm -hmm. And that you are more aware mm -hmm. of trying to not react in the mm -hmm. relationship according to those yeah. fears. Well, just to summarize what mm. I think I've learned about you, Jake, I think that because you've grown up in such an incoherent and painful world, I think you developed an incoherent sense of self mm -hmm. that really fluctuated between the side of yourself that was in deep need mm. and pain as well as anger about the circumstances that you had to cope with. And that vacillates with this side of you that's learned how to survive by taking care of others in a relationship, mm -hmm. controlling and organizing that relationship by being pleasant, entertaining, mm -hmm. and protective of the other person. Yeah. And that, I think, has made it very hard for you to feel um, like you could do good for yourself mm -hmm. and receive good things from other people. Yeah. Was, yeah. When people would be nice to me, I would get angry. <laughs> because yeah. it didn't make sense for you. It didn't you. make sense, yeah. And that's what I think is essentially very painful about having borderline personality disorder is that incoherent sense of self yeah. <laughs> causes people to lash out when they actually get their needs met yeah. because they either don't trust it or it's not enough to solve the painful problems that they've lived with. Mm. But it seems to me, Jake, that you've somehow found a way to understand your difficulties so that you're not always reacting to mm -hmm. this constant fear of living the same experiences yeah. of trauma over and yeah. over again. Yeah, not reacting is the thing, but I'm always f feeling it, which is still awful. <laughs> it yeah. is. It is. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, what has it been like for you talking about all of this with me today? It's interest it's very uncomfortable it's very like i feel like i'm i am scattered I, it's because it's just like there's so much to cover like i literally could be here for 40 hours and i still want to have scratched the surface it feels it feels so skin deep and all that but um yeah you're right about that yeah, <laughs> yeah. how could this possibly get to the depth of what you've been through yeah this disorder is very isolating, very isolating and very confusing and just finding out what you are <laughs> after so many years of like, no, it's not this, Some, you know, I don't know if they're right. And like, like, oh, so it's, you know, so here it is. It's like, oh no, I have this, but yay, I, I know. And uh, it does start with the diagnosis, I feel. Getting like, I mean, you can't like go to a doctor and, you know, get treated for diabetes or whatever getting but you're getting like some other treatment for like something else like how is that going to help the diabetes same mm -hmm. same concept i feel mm -hmm. so yeah <laughs> i'm doing my best you sure are <laughs> yeah thank you yes thank you